All right, let's go on. Um, let's do a little example here. Let's consider, I better move this so I don't write on it. Um, let's consider now that we have the main memory reference string to memory access at memory locations uh, in this order. Um, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 3, 4, 15. Okay, and we'll start with an empty cache. All blocks are initially marked as not valid, so we'll leave blank to mean not valid. And when we put something into the cache, if it's valid, then we'll mark it as valid, OK? So we're going to start by recognizing we have four cache blocks. So that means we're going to do mod 4 for every address. We ask for 0, and it's not there, so what do we do? We have a miss, so what do we do? Go get it, and bring it up, and put it in the cache, right? Where does it go? Here, 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 here. Here, why? Because this mod 4 is 0, 0. Okay, so we're going to put it here. The value in 0 goes there. And the tag will be 0, 0. And the valid bit will be valid. Okay, great. Then, and these are still nothing, nothing, nothing. Invalid, invalid, invalid. Now we ask for 1. So what's going to happen in this situation? Same thing, right? It's a miss. Go down and get it. Where do we put it? Because the mod of 1 mod 4 is, is 0, 1. OK, so now it's going to look like this. Valid, valid, tag 0, 0, tag 0, 0. Value of 0, value of 1. Now we go to here and do 2. What's our cache going to look like after that? I think you can see it pretty quick. Valid, 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 tag zero, zero, tag zero, zero. Why is the tag zero, zero? Because the upper bits, not the lower bits, but the upper bits, the result of the division, not the remainder of the division. The remainder of the division are these indexes. The result is the tag. So the tags go there. So here's the value of zero, of one, and of two. Then we go three. That's this reference. What's the cache going to look like after that one? Valid, 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 valid. Tags. Value of 0, 1, 2, and 3. And our cache is full. And now it's time to reference 4, memory address 4. What's going to happen now? The mod 4 of 4 is 0, 0. So we say, oh, here we go. Hey, I've got something valid. But what about the tag? This is tag is 0, 1. That doesn't match this tag, does it? So it's a miss. It's not in cache. So what's going to happen? Put it in cache. Where? Right there. So that means that has to go out, doesn't it? Ah, so now it's going to look like this. We're going to have valid, 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 valid. But the tag is going to be 01, meaning address 4's data is stored here. Address 1's data, address 2's data, address 3's data is stored here. So it's going to be data from 4, 1, 2, 3, right? Notice it's the last four references. 4, 3, 2, 1 is the last four references Oops, stored in cache, as we would expect. Now we ask for 3 again. So what happens? 0, 0, 1, 1. What happens? Mod 1, 1. Go look here. Tag of 0, 0. Yes, valid. Bingo. It's a hit. It's our first real hit. So we have a hit. So the cache doesn't change at all. It stays the same. We just found it and read it and use it. So we'll, I'll just put here same. Now we ask for 4. What's going to happen? Same thing, a hit. We look at this. We say, go to the 0, 0 with index location. See if we can match the tag. Yes, we match. Is it valid? Yes. Bingo, it's a hit. So again, same. Now we try 15. Let's go to 15. 15 is 1, 1, 1, 1. So what do I do? Mod 4 says, look in the last location. Check if the tag is a match. It's not a match, so change it. Kick that out and put in 
than one. So our final, our final uh, version of this direct map cache is going to look like this. 01, 00, 00, and finally 11, right? And then this is going to be data in, what was this, 4, and then 1, and then 2, and then finally 15. Is that understandable to everyone, how that worked? So we did replacement as well. Did you notice that? But there was never any question about which one to replace. We knew exactly where to look, and we knew exactly who to replace, because it's direct mapped. Every location in memory has got only one place in cache to do business. If it's there in cache, it's in that location. It'll never be in any other location. So we know who to kick out, the one that's taking the place that you have to come into. So replacement's easy in a direct map cache. We don't have to choose, Ajiba, who am I going to kick out? It's clear. All right. So let's go see how we did. Final 01000011, memory in 4, 1, 2, and 15. Yeah. And we had two hits here and here. We had some misses in the beginning, which are necessary, called cold start misses. In fact, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 15 all have to be misses. Can you tell me why? 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 15 all have to be misses. Because it's the first time they're used, and you're always going to miss on the first time you're, that things are used. 3 and 4 could have been hits, could have been misses, and this was a cache example that they were both hits. So we had a hit rate as high as it could be. Six misses are necessary. Uh, the first time they're referenced. The second reference to three and second reference to four with a different kind of cache or different kind of cache management or architecture might have been misses, but they're hits because of uh, this particular one. Okay? Any questions about this? All right, so direct map cache. That's what we've taught, direct map cache, how it works, how you calculate the addresses, how you decide if you have a hit or a miss. And right, let's look at the MIPS, direct map cache. Things are going to get a little bigger here. Uh, we have one word blocks, so that means what we store here is exactly one word of data. The cache size is uh, 1K words or maybe or 4 kilobytes. So if we have 1K words, that means I have indexes from 0 all the way up to 1,023. How many bits is my index? 10 bits. So that means that of my 32 bits, I'm going to have to have 10 of them for the cache index. And that's the in 10 index bits right here. And it, it, whatever one it is tells me where to go and look in the cache. Since I'm storing um, 4 kilobytes, and since my MIPS addresses are byte addresses, as you remember, these two bits are byte offset. They tell me you know, which particular byte you're interested in in the word, right? So 00, zero means you're interested in this byte, 01, this byte, so on. This is a 4-byte object. The 32-bit quantity is a 4-byte object. So if I take off those two and those 10, that's 12 bits, that leaves me 20 bits of upper address that don't go away, and those are the tag. So that means that I'm going to store 20 bits of tag along with 32 bits of data and one bit of valid, grand total 53 bits. So 53 bits is not an even number of bytes, so probably it's going to end up being 56, which is 7 bytes of information, or maybe even rounded up to 8 and 64 bytes. So every one of these is probably 7 or 8 bytes. Um, the uh, cache data area holds uh, 4 kilobytes. That means the rest of this is the other 3 kilobytes of extra necessary. OK, so now uh, look how we're doing here. We're, we're going to an index location, and we're asking, does the tag stored there match the tag field, the 20 field, stored in the address. If this matches that, and if the valid bit is also true, do we have that? Are we looking here? Yeah. If the valid bit is also true, so I have both those are equal and the valid bit is true, what does this mean if that's high? Yeah, you got a hit. Yes, it's the thing you're looking for. So hardware does this with a comparator. Is this equal to this, and is this true? Those are the questions we're asking. If so, this data is the data you're looking for, and off it goes as the requested data, or code, whatever it is, the requested value of that 32-bit address. And this is a lot faster than going to main memory, because this is going to be out of static RAM, and main memory is going to be out of dynamic RAM. Why is this going to be out of static RAM? Because it's small. That's how. 
because it's small. Okay. Um, in direct map caches, where the block size is one word, what kind of locality are we taking advantage of? If I miss and bring in the thing I missed on, does it include any neighbors before or after? No. So I'm not taking account of spatial locality at all. So all this holds is if I missed before, it'll be there in the future. What kind of locality is that? Temporal locality. This is only taking advantage of temporal locality because the block size is just one word. It says if I miss on you, I get you, never mind your neighbors. So I'm, I'm not taking advantage of any uh, spatial locality if I don't include neighbors. All right, now let's change the cache and make it a multi-word block direct map cache. And now I'm going to go with four words per block. And the cache size is one kilo word as it was before. Look what happened. How many indexes do I have now? Only 256. Why? Because at each index, I've got four different words stored. So the total size is still the same, one kilo words, four kilobytes. I didn't change the cache size any. I reorganized it. I made less of these and more of those. So now I've got data going from here to here. So if I have a hit on this one, it means I'm also going very soon to be able to have a hit on that one, and a hit on that one, and a hit on that one. Spatial locality is now included in the design of this cache and temporal, temporal and spatial locality. OK? All right, you can see that it works the same here. I've got a 20-bit tag. I've got to store the tag here to see if I match. I've got only an 8-bit index now instead of a 10-bit index. Why is that? Because I've only got 8 bits worth of index positions. 256 is an 8-bit index. That leaves me four extra bits here. Now, two of those are the byte offset, which we had before. And the other two of those are the block offset. They're telling me, which one do I want? This one, or this one, or this one, or this one, right? Yeah, the least significant bits of that tell me which member of it do you want. And then the least significant bits of all say which member of that. That one, that one, that one, that one. Do you understand? OK, now, what does this do? This block offset comes around as an input to this 4 to 1 multiplexer. So look what we're doing here. We're saying, take the data, but select which word you want. Take all four words, bring them down here, and now choose the one that is going to go off to the data that was requested. So I'm not going to take 128 bits. I'm going to just get one 32-bit piece, or that 30. This is a 32-bit piece that I'm taking, one out of one fourth of the total that comes into this MUX. That's if I have a hit. I still check hit the same way over here. Does the 20-bit tag field match? Is the data a bit valid? Yes. If yes, then I have a hit. Take the data. OK. Any questions about this direct mapped architecture? This one takes spatial and temporal locality as part of its design. OK, there's a little example here. Um, can everybody see that this cache has now only got two locations, but it's got the same amount of cache space? I did the same thing here. Shrank this and expanded this. Same string here. Everybody see that? OK. And what do we have last time? Six misses, which were compulsory because they were the first time, and two hits on three and four. Remember? That's what we had last time. Same thing is going on here. The eight references are shown here. Just to save a little time, why don't we uh, just jump to the conclusion here. And you can see what happened here. Zero is a miss, so it brings in what? Zero and one. Then one is a hit. Two is a miss, so it brings in two and three. Three is a hit. Ah, the neighbors turned out to be useful, didn't they? They're good neighbors. All right. Then, then four is a miss, and when four is a miss, where does it go? Ooh, right here where uh, zero and one were. Now four and five go here, right? Three's a hit because it already was a hit. It's still a hit. And four is a hit, 
because I just brought it in, so I miss on the first four, but hit on the second four, and then 15 is obviously a miss. So now let's have a look. One hit, two hits, three hits, four hits out of eight. My hit rate has gone up to 50%. And what looked like Mejbur misses on the first access to one and the first access to three now became hits because of spatial locality, bringing them both. A miss was followed by a hit, both on zero, one, and in for two, three. A miss. So we can see that I raised the hit rate considerably here. Raise the hit rate considerably here. Much better performance in this, in this cache because it takes care of both kinds of localities. Any questions about what we're doing here? All right, we didn't do that, but you can see it's here on the slide, and the slide will be posted. You can go over it. All right, now let's look at a little bit of analysis about uh, miss rate versus block size versus cache size. In the two examples that I showed you, we expanded the block size without changing the cache size. Remember, cache got smaller in terms of number of blocks, but the size of a block got bigger. And we're going to analyze those two parameters to see how hit rate uh, manages with those two. We obviously want higher hit rates. That would be the goal. OK, so miss rate is on this axis. So it's 1 minus the hit rate. So what I want is low miss rate. And you can see the miss rates are anywhere from 0%, 5%, 10%, right? So my hit rate, even in this worst case right here, is still over 90%. My miss rate is about 9.5% up here. Well, obviously, where I'd like to be is here, if I'm on that curve, because that's the lowest miss rate. If I'm on this curve, I'd like to be here, because that's the lowest miss rate. If I'm on this curve, I'd like to be here. Can you see that the middle, where block size is about 64 bytes, seems to be the best location? Smaller block sizes make the curves go up. Larger block sizes make the curves go up. Okay, so in terms of block size, which is related to what factor? What factor is it related to? What locality is it related to? Spatial. In terms of block size, bigger and bigger and bigger isn't always better. The middle seems to be the place where all these curves seem to find their they have, the miss rate goes up if the block size becomes a significant fraction of the cache size. If the block size becomes a significant fraction of the cache size, then it goes up. Notice these caches have different sizes. 256 out of 8 kilobytes is a reasonably significant percentage. It starts to go back up. Okay, and the reason for that is if the block size gets too big as a percent of the cache, you don't have very many uh, cache locations. And as a consequence for that, the number of blocks that can be held in that cache this gets smaller, and you increase what's called the capacity misses. So even though you lowered uh, some misses, you raised other misses, so you end up with uh, moving away from the sweet spot. This is the sweet spot right in the middle of the curves. So you can see that cache design is an art, not a science. The trade-off between block size and miss rate and cache overall size. Well, hold you, let's just make bigger caches, solve the problem. Pull out your wallet and spend, spend. OK, but there's a transistor budget. There's an amount of area. Everybody knows that if you buy a processor with bigger caches, you pay more. Two megabytes is not enough for you. We can sell you a four megabyte cache, but hey, Kardashian, it's going to cost you more. That's more transistors. That's more area. You're giving up something else, aren't you? OK, so that's the first thing to see here is that <coughs> miss rate does improve with increasing block size until you get past the sweet spot, and then it starts to go the other way. Notice that the small cache is affected by this much more than the bigger caches. Look at this one. It doesn't even really seem to turn at all, because it's a very big cache. So 256 blocks or bytes out of 256 kilo is only 1 in 1,000. But over here, it's a much bigger percentage. All right. Now, the number of bits in a cache includes both the storage for the data and the tags. We saw that the um, addresses are 32, bit by 32 bits and they're byte addresses in MIPS. If you have a direct map cache with n, 2 to the n blocks, then n bits have to be used for the index. That's obvious. We've been doing that already. So um, for a block size of 2 to the m words, m bits are used to address the word within the block, and 2 bits are used to address the byte within the word. And so let's see if there's a 
example of this. No, there isn't actually. All right, so let's erase the board and, and do a little bit of math there. You watched an example, but I don't believe that watching an example is enough to help you be sure that you have learned the principle. What we're saying is our address is a typical MIPS word. It's going to be 32 bits in MIPS anyway. This address is going to be broken up into various fields. I think we saw the tag field is whatever's left over. And down here, we're going to have to have a index. And we're going to have to have byte offset. And if the block size is greater than one word offset. So this means which byte out of the four so that's obviously a two-bit quantity. This means which word out of the n that you're storing. So this depends on block size. So if the, as it says here, if the block size is 2 to the m, then this is going to be m bits. The index is determined from the cache size. It says if the direct map cache has 2 to the n um, blocks, oh, well, that's direct map then n bits are going to be used for the index. So I'll have n if this is from 2 to the n blocks, and I'll have m if this is 2 to the m words per block. So what's the total size of the tag field? The tag field is clearly 32 minus 2 minus m minus n, isn't it? There's the tag field is what's left over after I get rid of that and that and that. Okay. Right. And in the last example, here, 2 and 2 and 8 makes 12, so the tag field is 20. Okay. Makes sense. 32 minus 2 minus 2 minus 8 equals 20. So the tag is whatever's left over after you take out these other ones. <coughs> OK. Um, hits and misses. Let's talk a little bit about this. Um, Read hits, that's what we want. I'm reading instruction memory, yay, I found the instruction. Without having to go to reading instruction cache, I don't have to go to memory. Reading data cache, hey, I found it. I don't have to go to memory to get the data. That's what we want. Write hits, we don't ever write into instruction memory, but we do write into data memory. So what I'd like to do is find what I want to write in the data cache and not have to go to main memory because it's slow. So the question here is, I'm changing the value in cache. So that means that the copy in cache is the same as the one in memory until I write the copy in cache, and now it's different than the one in main memory. What about that? Is that a problem? That's the question. We require that the cache and the memory be consistent with each other. A couple of reasons. The first one is, when all is said and done, I'm going to take memory's values and write them back to disk. When the, when the whole process or program is done, the final thing stored in memory might change the value on disk. Whoa, wait, wait, no, the memory value is not the right one, it's the cache one. Well, then obviously the cache one better be get back down to memory. So there needs to be a consistency. Now, one way to do it is to always write into both the cache block, which is the fast write, and the next level in the memory hierarchy, which is the slow write. We call that write through. That means every write is really two writes. Of course, that'll keep them consistent, but what will be the disadvantage of that? Slow. Yeah, the advantage of cache was get in and get out. Now it's, well, yes, but there's this slow one you also have to do, and it's slow. You can't get in and get out. So the problem with that is the writes run at the speed of the next level, which is the slower one. So it's going to be very slow unless we do something like have a write buffer, which would mean write to cache and write to this quick buffer and let the buffer do the slow write later. And as you're done, you move on, and the write buffer pushes it into memory. That's one way to do it, to have a write buffer. And only stall if the write buffer is full. You know, you write to cache and you say, I'm writing to the write buffer. Wait, you're full. You can't, no, I can't take it. I'm too, I've got this other work. You've got to wait. Okay, then you stall. In other words, your write causes a stall if the buffer is full. Make a big enough buffer, it won't stall. Another way to do it is to allow the cache and the memory to be different from each other for a short period of time, and then make sure that what the final value in cache gets written back to main memory before we go on. 
So the idea here is that we only write the data uh, in the cache back into main memory, which is called write back policy. Notice this is write it both, so it's kind of like write through. I write it to cache and it keeps on going through to memory or the next level. Here I don't write through, I write only to the top one and later write it back into the lower one. Okay, and the idea here is that you write it when that cache block is evicted. Raise your hand if you know the meaning of the English word evicted. Okay, that's because it never happened to your family. Let me explain what happens if you're evicted. You come home to your apartment one day and the key doesn't work. And you notice that your furniture is out on the street. And you knock on the door and a new voice from the inside says, we're living here now. You're, this is not your apartment anymore. And you call up the landlord. What happened? It was my place when I left in the morning. Somebody else is in there now and you've changed the locks and my furniture is on the street. The landlord says, you know what? You didn't pay your rent for three or four or five months. You've been evicted. You can't do that. Yes, I can. I have a court order from a judge which says evict. Okay? Evict is kicked out without your permission, without your will. Now, I don't know if that happens in Turkey like that. Maybe it's a little different here. I have heard of idra on furniture. But ultimately, if you don't pay your rent as a business person or as a, 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 a renter, to your landlord for business or home, you get evicted, right? You know, you're not allowed to live in a place you don't own and be not even paying the rent, so you're evicted. Well, evict means to be kicked out. So when the cash block is evicted, that's when we write it back to main memory. Did we see any eviction in the examples that we've done so far? Yeah, we did. When the new one came in to a direct map cache and said, hey, that's my place and I'm the top Taze new guy, what did the old one do? The old one says, yeah, sorry, okay. The old one was evicted, wasn't it? It left. So now, let's think about this for a minute. If the old one has not been changed, when it's evicted, we don't need to do any write to main memory because they're identical, right? If, it, if it's been copied into cache and never changed, then they're still the same, they're consistent. But if the one in cache being evicted has been changed and written to, now it's different than the one in main memory. We can't throw it in the trash. We have to do what? Write back. At that time, we have to do the write to update. So you, can you see that it would, if I write to something 12 times and then evict it, write through will cause 12 writes to main memory, but write back will only cause one write to main memory. Yeah. So multiple writes are reduced down in their number, and that's good because writes to main memory are slow, just like reads from main memory are slow. We can speed up our cache policy if we use the write back policy. But it means that temporarily the value in memory is not the top Taze current, only the cache value is, and they are inconsistent from each other. Inconsistent. Now, is that a problem? Not a problem if we do this and if we only have one cache. But imagine that we had a shared memory and we had multiple cores and they each had their own caches and they're saying, okay, I'm gonna read, I'm gonna write, I'm gonna read, I'm gonna write. So now what have we got is the value of X in main memory and then the cached value of X in all the caches of different processors, different cores. And what could possibly be happening? Think about it. The value in this cache won't be the same as the value in this cache. They both think it's X and they're both operating on it, uh-oh, could be trouble, yeah. Okay, so we call that problem the problem of cache consistency. It doesn't matter if cache and, and a lower level of the hierarchy are inconsistent, as long as we're careful, but it does matter if two equal levels of the hierarchy are inconsistent. That matters. Yeah, so we have to send a message from the cache which is asking, a um, processor asking for X in its own cache, and there are copies of X elsewhere, we have to find out, has anybody been changed lately? You know, Biraka, Mr. Processor, I'm not sure if I can give you this value because it might not be the latest value. It could be it's been changed by some other processors. I have to ask my friends the other caches, and I'll tell you in just a minute. And it's not enough to say to the main memory, hey, has anybody changed? That's not where the top Taze value is. The top Taze value is in the other caches. Or maybe it's a different way. Maybe when you write your own cache, you have to send a signal out to the other caches saying, hey guys, it's different now. I just changed it. 
Reading, no problem. We can all read X as long as we want. It won't change. But it's when you change it, now any future reads need to know about that change. Pardon? So why can't we use change, change for uh, writes? Shared cache for write. Well, then would we also have a shared cache for read? OK, then if it's shared cache, then it's just shared memory. If it's shared, everybody's using it, then it's just shared memory. It's not cache. Cache is local to the processor. Remember, cache is shlemjia ait, shlemjia ozel, shlemjia yakin. So as soon as you say it's shared, we all have it, then it's not closer to you or closer to me. It's just general. It's ortoda. So it's not a cache. If we use a shared cache, then we eliminate the consistency problem, I agree. But we, we, then we have a problem of traffic to this cache. We have all these people trying to do fast accesses to a shared resource. And it's not local and ozel and ait. It's ortoda and ortak. So we're going to end up with conflicts, reading and writing, waiting, queuing, habidaka, when's my turn? And so the performance gain will be killed by a shared cache. So in order to be fast, it needs to be ozel. OK, um, so what we're going to do, as I said here, in order to make sure that we do write it back when we kick it out, when we evict it, we need a bit called the dirty bit to say, have you been changed? Or, you know, when I go home at night, I don't know if you do this, but if your clothes are clean, then you just can put them back in the hanger or in the shelf. But if they're dirty, you put them in the washing machine. If it's dirty, it needs an activity. If it's clean and so to speak, unchanged, you know, then, then you can use it again. And the idea here is if the bit it says this was written to, then we have to write it through, no, write it back. If the bit says nobody changed it, just as it was read, it's still the same, then it's only been read, and we don't need to do a write through, a write back. So, um, and what we can do is when we have to write back, we could still use a write buffer here in order to be done in and out quickly. We say, okay, you've got to write this back to main memory, but I'm going to go on with my processing, put it in the buffer, and the buffer will do the write backs of the dirty blocks. So now what we've done with this approach is write much less often and only write the ones that have to write that have been changed from cache and use a write buffer. So we get the advantages of this, but a whole lot less writes. But now, what causes misses in caches? Let's analyze. We've seen some little bitty cache behaviors. We can see already that there's some categories. The first misses are called compulsory misses. You must miss because it's the first time uh, that you're accessing the data. First reference, when a process starts up, these are sometimes called cold start misses or compulsory misses. If you access a block the first time, the cold fact of life is you're not going to find it already in the cache. It's going to be a miss. And there's not a whole lot you can do about it. But if you're going to run millions of instructions, it's no big deal. Because once you get active and they're in, then you'll start having high hit rates. So these initial compulsory misses are insignificant. You could help yourself, as we did by increasing the block size. So that means that when you bring in x, you bring in x plus 1, x plus 2, and some neighbors, and now you're going to reduce the cold start misses. We saw that happen, didn't we? We saw two of our cold start misses go away when we increased our block size. The only problem is um, it increases the miss penalty. Because when you have bigger block size and you don't find what you want, instead of bringing in 1, you bring in n items of a block. The block is bigger. Bringing it in is slower. So the miss penalty gets bigger when block size gets bigger. All right, capacity misses. There's another one. The cache just cannot hold all the blocks that the program is accessing. And you're going to have misses because it's not big enough. And the solution is make cache bigger. But if cache is bigger, it's going to increase the access time of cache and therefore the hit time. Because it's slower to go to a big cache, faster to go to a little cache. So capacity misses can be reduced and the hit rate raised. But the cost will be lowering the hit, raising the hit time. OK, conflict misses. That's collisions. We had a little bit of that. We saw they, they're mapped to the same place. And solutions to that include um, increasing the cache size. If I increase the cache size, what happens? n to 1 becomes 
m to 1, where m is smaller than n. I have less contention to the same place. As cash gets bigger, I have less arrows from various memory blocks saying, that's my spot in cash, that's my house, that's my home, that's my yazlik. Okay? Right. So that would help. Another thing you could do is increase the associativity. And you don't even know what that is, so stay tuned. We're going to change the architecture of the cache and make it more associative, which may increase the access time, may slow it down a little bit. Okay? So I think we're not going to get to associativity today. All right, so how to handle misses. Let's talk about what you do when there's a miss. Let's do this slide here. If you're trying to read instruction or data, notice that instruction and data caches are separate. And that was clear from the very beginning. Did we notice? Instruction cache is a different cache from data cache. And the reason for that is that their localities are different. Code access tends to be a little more spread than data access. That's the first thing. Second thing is that their sizes may be different. Their architectures and designs can be different if you make them separate. You can tune the instruction cache for the instruction access patterns you think your processor is going to be seeing and tune the data cache. So therefore, they can be designed differently. We'll see some manufacturers and some architectures, some memory designs that have, in fact, done that. So it's different uh, kinds of uh, architectures for these different caches. That's the first thing. The second thing is, it's really clear. Every time you have a reference, you know if it's a data reference or an instruction reference. Instruction references happen during the fetch stage. Data references happen during the memory stage, either reading or writing data memory. So we know that they're separate, so sp and splitting them helps us. They're already split anyway in the model that we had of our pipeline. Early on, we do instruction reference, so let's try to hit in an instruction cache. Late on, we do data reference, let's try to hit in a data cache. So split cache here has been our understanding from the beginning. So that's why you see the um, terminology here, the symbols, instruction cache, data cache. All right, so if we have a miss trying to read either one, then we cannot continue. So we need to stall the pipeline, and then we need to fetch the block that we want from the next lower level and bring it up and put it um, in the cache, and then send the thing we were asking for to the processor, whether it's an instruction to be fetched or a data, and then let the pipeline resume. So we've got to stall the pipeline on a cache read miss. Is that clear? You can't proceed because you're asking in a one clock cycle uh, event, I've got to get this thing now, and if it's not in the cache, you're not going to get it in one clock cycle from the lower level. You know that. So we have to stall. Can't go on. Can't say, well, I was supposed to fetch it, but it isn't there. I'll just continue anyway. What are you going to continue with? If you didn't fetch the instruction, you can't decode it. All right. Now, what about write misses? Those only happen for the data cache, of course. We never write instruction. Here, you've got to have to stall the pipeline, or do this, or do this. Notice there's three things that could be possible solutions. Stall the pipeline, fetch the block from the next lower level in the memory, install it in the cache, which may involve having to invict a dirty block out if there's a write back uh, policy. All right? Notice here, if we have to install it in the cache and evict somebody, we haven't changed that instruction, you just kick it out. The perfect copy is still in the instruction memory. But here, if we're kicking out data, it could be we changed it. And if it's write back policy, you have to be sure you write it out. It's dirty. And then you have to write the word from the processor into the cache that you were trying and then let the pipeline continue. That's pretty much the clone of this, with the exception of dirty bit and write back. Or try something different. Try what, have a policy called write allocate, in which case what you're doing is just write the word into the cache, updating both the tag and the data. In other words, don't bring it up and then change it. Just write it into the cache. You know what the new value is. You're about to do it. You're writing it. Why do I need the old value? This says get the old value and change it. This says write the new value directly into the cache. Okay? There's no need to check for it if it's a hit or a miss. There's no need to stall. I like this better than this, don't you? You know, if I'm going to write something, it's new, I'm just creating it. Why do I need the old thing and then change it? Why do I need to check if I have it? Just put it in there. Okay? Clever idea. That's called write allocate. Or another one called no write allocate. Skip the cache write. Don't even write it to the cache. 
but you must invalidate that cache block since it's now going to hold stale data if it's a hit. If it would have been a hit, you say, ah, you're invalid now. And you just write the word to the right buffer, which is going to put it in the lower level. Huh, interesting. If it's not in the cache, don't worry, we're not writing the cache anyway. If it's in the cache, just invalidate it, but don't actually write it to cache. Write it to the right buffer and go on. And the right buffer will put it into the main memory. So this one says, just put it in cache. This one says, just put it in main memory. And this one says, bring it up from main memory and write on top of it. Okay? Three different approaches to doing writes um, when you have a miss. Okay? All right, we will, we'll have to stop there. This is now when it's multi-word. I think that's enough. Okay, you can see that this is pretty serious business. If you've hung in there in this course this long, I beg you, please don't get kopmush now. Therefore, study this stuff. Read it. Go over it. Spend time in it. It's not going to be enough in lecture alone to keep up. These are quite intellectually challenging things. So add to your data input by reading the chapter. Go online, Google it, or Wikipedia it. Or, but this is tough stuff. Don't, don't, you know, hafif me. This is really challenging. Okay, see you guys later.